Okay, brothers and sisters, you can see I've got on the top of the screen there, hopefully, Saul Spear, because I couldn't remember what the title was. <laughs> I've given this talk once before. Um, so this is the second era, but I couldn't remember what uh, title I, I gave Brother Daz. But effectively, we, we are going to talk about this chapter, 1 Samuel 26, and Saul Spear is going to be a major feature of it. And... Um, we read the first verse that the Ziphites came unto Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself in the hill of Hakilah, which is before Jeshimon? And um, the Ziphites were of Judah. These are men of Judah. These are close brethren to David, and yet they betray him. And if you keep your finger there and just come back to chapter 23, we pick up the story in verse 19 of this chapter. Then came up the Ziphites to Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself with us in the strongholds of the wood, in the Hakilah, which is on the south of Jeshimon? Now therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of thy soul to come down, and our part shall be deliver him into the king's hand. And Saul said, Blessed be ye of the Lord, for ye have compassion on me. And then the, the story unfolds. So the Ziphites have done this before. Now, on the first occasion, David was um, delivered in as much that God intervened and sent forth an angel unseen um, to bring the Philistines into the area. And Saul was taken away because he had to address the Philistines. Uh, otherwise, David would have been in a real precarious position. He was actually uh, trapped where he was. But uh, Saul had to withdraw. This is all of the providence of God and an answer to David's prayers. And then once the Philistines have been dealt with by Saul, and we're not given the details as to what happened on that, but Saul returns um, from that and starts pursuing David again. We, we find him at En Gedi. And you remember David was um, in the cave at En Gedi with his men. And then Saul went into that cave and David had an opportunity to slay him, um, but did not. He showed grace to him, mercy to him. He would not touch the Lord's anointed. So you remember that incident there, um, that first occasion where David had Saul in his hand, but he spared him. Well, it was the Ziphites who really start all that process off. It's quite a long process as, as I've outlined, but nevertheless, it was the Ziphites who said to Saul, look, he's in this area, he's in our area. So how sad that is that David should have brethren. You know, these, these are brethren of his own tribe, betraying him not once, but twice. And in a way, it's a bit like, uh, you know, those of Israel that ought to have known better when they, knew of the Lord Jesus, um, but they, they would commit the Lord Jesus into the hands of the Romans, that the Romans may deal with him. And so we have a little, just in that incident, in these two incidents, the role of the Ziphites very much like the enemies of our Lord Jesus, who ought to have known better, uh, and they were of his brethren. May not have been those of Judah altogether, but they were of Israel, and they should have known who he was and responded to him accordingly, but no, they would sooner him dead. And the Ziphites would sooner see David dead. Well, in both incidents, we, we read this name, Hakilar, and uh, you have an opportunity there to look at that map. I'm sorry that the towns and the places are not in bigger text, but right at the top of the screen, you can see Jerusalem, I hope, and then you drop down Bethlehem, which is about four and a half miles away. So it gives you some idea of the scale. So we're not that far away, really, um, from Jerusalem, um, you know, down there in Hakilah, which is obviously marked with a red spot. So, and you can see Ziph um, immediately to the, the west of that. You could also see just uh, south of Ziph, Carmel, because between chapter 23 and uh, 24, 24 is when David spares Saul and Gedi. We have 25, and 25 is about Nabal. Remember the story of Abigail and Nabal? 
and Nabal was a man of Maon. And David had protected his sheep, his flocks, his large flocks in that area. So you can see all, all of this is happening in that area. But anyway, we better come back to, to 1 Samuel 26. And um, we read there in verse 4. And David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched. And David beheld the place where Saul lay. And Abner and the son of Ner, the captain of the Hergs, and Saul lay in the trench and the people pitched around about him. So David comes down where Saul was. Uh, just going back to that verse four. Uh, David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul was coming. He's very deep. Not too sure how that worked out. I mean, David had friends as well as enemies here. And thankfully, by the grace of God, he was told that Saul was on the hunt again. Um, and so then David sent men out to see exactly where Saul was. And then having found his location, uh, he goes right right to the heart of it. You know, I'm tempted to say right into the lion's den. You, you fully understand what I mean. He goes to Saul's camp. And he'll go to the very heart of Saul's camp. So completely different now, this to En Gedi. I, I say this because there are some uh, shoddy, superficial uh, folk that comment on these areas of scripture and will actually say that David's sparing Saul is one incident um, how they can come to that, I don't know. They're clearly two different incidents. And um, this situation is different from Engedi. With Engedi, Saul, inverted commas by perchance, came into David, to David, where David was and his men in that cave. I mean, it's obviously a large cave system. You know, he's got uh, upward of 400 men there. Um, so it's a big cave system. But it was Saul that went there, and it was 3,000 men of Saul without. But this is completely the other way around. The initiative is entirely by David, and it's David that comes into Saul's camp. So, you know, while Saul unwittingly came amongst David's men in that cave, this is all contrived by contrast by David. And we see David with Abishai with purpose go amongst Saul's men. And uh, whilst Saul went in that cave, it seems in daylight hours, David and Abishai are doing this in the darkness of the night. So they're completely different. You know, there's some amazing contrasts. Um, but we won't dwell any more on that. Um, just to say that in verse 6, David gives a challenge. He says to Ahimelech the Hittite and to Abishai the son of Zerawiah, brother to Joab, saying, who will go down with me to Saul to the camp? And Abishai I said, I will go down with thee. So David has a plan. And it involves himself and one other, just the two. That's all it needs. He's got a plan, uh, and we, we see it unfold. But, you know, when he, when he goes there and he takes of the spear and takes of the cruise of water, it's not something It's just come to his mind there and then. It's all planned. He's thought about it prayerfully. He's thought about this. And it's interesting he turns to these two, the two most likely, maybe the Two, he thought, were the, the, the fittest, strongest, most ablest, bravest. I don't know, brothers and sisters, but he turns to these two. Now, Ahimelech, the Hittite, is only here in Scripture, far as I know. I, I can't read of him anywhere else as an individual. Um, but he obviously was a faithful man. And it's interesting, he's a Gentile. So David asks of him and also asks of his nephew, Abishai, who incident is about the same age, because you remember David uh, was the eighth of uh, eight boys. So he was the youngest of that line, of that line, but on, through his father's sister, 
Zarawaya, Abishai, so I suggest they're, they're about the same age. But anyway, Abishai, he's the one that responds first to the challenge. And he will go. I've just put on the screen here, like Uriah, um, Ahimelech was a, a Hittite, another faithful man. So the Hittites, um, at least a few of them, came to love David. There's a certain irony on that when his own kith and kin, those in even Judah, such as the Sippites, uh, can't have this same love, quite the opposite. There's, a, there's an awful contrast in that, in that situation. And um, David's nephew goes forth, as I say. Just thinking a little bit about Abishai, you remember much later on, when there's Absalom's revolt, you know, we're, we're a good few years further on. But when we have Absalom's revolt and David's fleeing, we have Shimei of the tribe of Benjamin who insults David, curses David, throws stones at David, or probably others with Shimei that he was leading on in doing this. And Abishai, uh, for his loyalty and love of David, wants to intervene. And it's he who wants to kill Shimei. But you remember David stopped him uh, and said, no, um, you know, this is my son that's waging uh, this warfare with me. And it's all of God. And let's leave everything into God's hands. And so he will, he will leave Shimei. But Ab Abishai was, was quick there to, to intervene. And... You know, there we have it. You know, why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over, I pray, and take off his head. And the king said, what have I to do with you, ye sons of Zerah? So, so let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, curse David. Who shall then say, wherefore hast thou done so? So he sees this cursing even as part of the punishment of God, and he's prepared to bear it. And amazingly, such is the charisma um, and the character of David is able to hold Abishai back, even though he's talking in terms of a dead dog and so on. You know, he's, he's not talking calmly and, and necessarily rationally here. You know, his ackles are up. He's ready to go. But David calms him. And then when David returns to Jerusalem after the defeat of Absalom, Shimei comes on the scene again. And Shimei lays it all out, doesn't he? He tries to flatter David. He does his utmost to, to turn things around because he knows his life is in peril. Um, and Abishai, he's still angry. <laughs> he's still angry. And he wants to slay him. But Abishai, the son of Zerah, answered, said, shall not Shimei be put to death for this? Because he cursed the Lord's anointed. And David said, what have I to do with you, sons of Zeruiah, that you should this day be adversaries unto me? Shall there any man be put to, to death this day in Israel? For do I not know that I am this day king over Israel? And so David again calms Abishai. And the emphasis here is that I, I'm still king. I'm, I'm, my, my reign is, and realm is, is secure. That, that's evident. I'm, I'm restored as king. There's no need for any more bloodshed. But notice what Abishai says here. You know, he's gone away and thought about things. And he didn't use these terms on the first occasion, but he uses these terms now. Because he cursed the Lord's anointed. So he's learned. You know, he's gone away and he's thought about this. He's thought, hang on a minute. Uh, you can't curse the Lord's anointed. Um, I've been in the presence of my master twice with Saul, and he's made reference to the Lord's anointed, whereby no one could touch Saul. And Saul was worthy of death in truth, and I would have done it, but no, I couldn't because he's the Lord's anointed. Well, hang on a minute. David is clearly the Lord's anointed in this situation. There is no other. There is no other. He is the Lord's anointed. I'll deal with this. So you notice how Abishai is moved on in his thinking, but he's still wrong. He's still wrong. 
you know, his spirituality is, is not of the same level as David, which is, uh, you know, really close to being Christ-like. But to be fair to Abishai, and he's loyal to him, all the way through at the end of David's days, when he's not the man of strength before, he actually saves David's life. And I'll just round this off. Ishbi Benob, which was one of the sons of the giant. You know, we're going back to the days of Goliath thing, aren't we? The weight whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass and weight. He'd been good with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. And from there on, David was not allowed to go forth into battle. Um, Abishai intervened there, and this time rightly so. No protest from David, um, because we have no, no anointed one here, or no one of the, of the people of God for that matter. You know, this is a Philistine he's dealing with, so um, Abishai intervened, and, and David was spared, and uh, it, it mattered not for Ishbi and Ben more fought him. So interesting character is Abishai. Reading of verse 7, uh, the pair of them go by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster, but Abner and the people lay round about him. So we're, we're told here that in this encampment, the Abnos, the captain of the host, is close to Saul as he ought to be, um, but the king is encircled. You know, the people lay round about him. So Abner's close to the king, but then there's a, a close bodyguard of men around Saul, and I suggest to you that the circles go out from there. So Saul is at the centre, and Abner's right by him, and the toughest, strongest, most ablest, fittest men, they're there too, uh, to guard Saul. So all that we can, we can glean from that verse 7. It doesn't take too much imagination for us to realise that. But it's interesting that by the Spirit, we're told that his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. Interesting that, you know, the Spirit should give us that added detail with respect to Saul. Take note, his spear is stuck in the ground. And notice, it had his bolster or that which he was using for a pillow. So we've got to think now that here's Saul, and he's got this spear really close to him, right by his head, right there. And we're being told that. We've, it's being pointed out to us by the Spirit. You know, mark that well. This is significant. Uh, so here's a, a drawing of the scene. and. Um, the men in front of Abishai, they're not dead, they're asleep. You remember that we're told that they, they, a deep sleep fell upon them. It's the same expression, same idea as to when Adam uh, was asleep with the creation of Eve. And later on with Abraham in Genesis 15, when he's given the promises, it's the same sleep. It's a God-given sleep which I always find a bit tough for Abner because later on with David charges Abner with negligence and really tells him off the strip for, for, for not guarding his master as he ought. I, I feel somewhat sorry for Abner because this is a deep sleep of the Lord. Uh, they're, they're, they're unconscious. But anyway, you can see in this picture there's some depiction of something like it was now they've got Abishai there, hand on the spear, uh, are ready to make good use of it. So that's Saul's spear. And it serves as an identity marker, doesn't it, brothers and sisters? You know, you stood a few feet away, you would see that spear. If you were more than a few feet, you might well see that spear. So for all the men that are laid out uh, and... 
asleep. Uh, there probably wouldn't be too many would have this spear just like that. So I'm going to suggest you it serves as a bit of a marker for Saul. But it does so um, in, in, in other ways, other than the, maybe the physical witness that it's giving there, you know, which I might be overplaying in actual fact. There may be others have a spear stuck in the ground, but I, I don't think so. But, that's, you know, that's a debatable point. So whatever it may be in a physical sense, spiritually, it's certainly an identity marker, brothers and sisters. Awfully, it's an identity marker. Um. You know, it's, it's not just about where he is within the camp. It's about Saul in general. It's about him in general. He relies too much upon it and not in the Lord. He has too much confidence in that spear. And he does not trust in Yahweh. And it's the, the folly of the man that's being shown here. And the spear is associated, as we see it, with the ground and with his head. You know, the spirit has got it right, brothers and sisters. This man is of the earth, is of the dust. He's not spiritually minded. He's not, his thoughts don't go heavenward. He, he thinks as a man of the world. He, he's very much associated with the ground. And um, this is what his head's about. This is what his thinking is about. He, he just thinks in the carnal way all the time, brothers and sisters. So it's right that we see this spear that's so often associated with Saul. We see it here, stuck in the ground, right by his head. Truly, we have a man here of the dust. Now, why do I say all that? We're going right back to the early days of Saul, 1 Samuel 13. We read, so it came to pass in the day of battle, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and Jonathan, his son, was there found. And so we find in the early days of Saul's reign, there were no swords, there were no spears. The Philistines had taken them away. Uh, and to get iron itself was extremely difficult. So there was no one. We're told here in this verse, uh, there's no one who's got a sword or a, or a spear, except these two. You know, that's how precious they were, really precious. Saul's got one, Jonathan's got one, no one else. Now we come down to the days of Goliath. And uh, I suspect the situation is much the same. And so Saul is too frightened to engage the enemy. And there's not one in the whole host that will go out before Goliath. And he's gone out day after day after day. He does it in morning when the morning sacrifice ought to be offered. And he does it in the evening when the evening sacrifice ought to be offered. The two burnt offerings, the daily offering which talks of dedication unto the lord and this philistine comes out and he curses israel and makes light of israel first thing in the morning at that very time of sacrifice and he does it again in the evening and he does it one day two days three days four days five days six days he does it 40 days brethren and sisters and not one not one not even jonathan sadly not one had the courage or the faith to go forth. But when David goes forth, he had no spear, he had no sword, he had his sling and five stones. But look what David says to the Philistine. Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will Yahweh deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. So David 
this youth may have only been 14 or 15, some say 17, I think younger, in his youth, stands up and he says these words. And a bit more, brothers and sisters. And all the assembly says, and all this assembly shall know, the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. But the battle is Yahweh's, and he will give you into our hands. And so here's, you know, a contrast between David and Saul. You know, these things might have been precious in the land of Israel, but to David it was of no consequence. Faith, faith is what is required, and he had faith. He had it, brothers and sisters. And so he could say these words to Goliath and say these words in the hearing of the nation, in the hearing of Saul, that Yahweh saveth not with sword and spear. But sadly, Saul didn't learn the lesson that day, and he will never learn that lesson. He will never learn it. And uh, David, you remember, um, is allowed to come before Saul in, in quite a times uh, into the palace. And because David was just a brilliant musician, he could play soothing music and calm Saul when he was restless and agitated. But sadly, when he was agitated, he brings that spear to bear, doesn't he? Look at this. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied in the midst of the house and David played with his hand as at other times. And there was a javelin, same word in the Hebrew, exactly the same word. There was a spear in Saul's hand and Saul cast the spear, but he said, oh, smite David into the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. And I think what that means is that Saul threw it the once and David managed to avoid it. And then Saul still running in anger, picks it up again. And a second time he throws it. And David misses it the second time. But this is Saul taking matters into his own hands in an ungodly way, of course. And it's his spear. That's 1 Samuel 18. We go into the next chapter and it happens again. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin, with his spear in his hand. And notice how we've got him. He sat there with his spear in his hand as if he never let it go. He sat there in his house with his spear in his hand. And David played with his hand. So one's got a harp in the hand. One's got a spear in the hand. And there's your two different men. And Saul sought to smite David to, even to the wall with the spear. But he, David, slipped away out of Saul's presence and he smote the javelin into the wall and David fled and escaped that night. So you now see he couldn't throw it a second time because it's lodged into the wall. So a little bit easy for David. <laughs> he only had to duck the once. Oh, God's looking after David, isn't he? God is looking after him. That spear's been thrown at him three times and he's managed to... Avoid it. But this is the spear by which Saul seeks to make progress in life and to protect his realm and all that is his. That he deals everything through his spear. I mean, this is later on in the, in the account, he gets annoyed with Jonathan. And he says, wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? You know, this is Jonathan to Saul now. You know, what, says Jonathan, he, he bravely speaks up to his father. He says, what has he done? Where, wherefore shall he be slain? And what happens? Saul cast a javelin, cast a spear at him to smite him. Whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. And what the spirit doesn't say there, but might as well have done, if need be, he'd kill his own son as well, such as his madness. So what I'm showing you here from these scriptures, brothers and sisters, if you haven't noticed it before, that Saul 
when he seeks judgment and wants his will to be upheld, he does it always through his spear. He never turns to God in prayer or seek another way. He takes it upon himself to throw the spear and he'd even throw it at his son, Jonathan. And you put those two men together, Jonathan and David, what, what characters, brothers and sisters, you know, you see in Jonathan, a type of Christ and you do so in David, what two wonderful men they were. Uh, and Jonathan loved David as his own soul. And he's the only one in scripture that ever has the words of, Leviticus 19 ascribed to him, love thy neighbor as thyself. Jonathan did that. We're told that explicitly in the record, that he loved David as himself. And for David, his love of Jonathan was beyond that of his love of women. They had a wonderful spiritual relationship. They were so godly brothers and sisters. And Saul would slay them both. Now, when Saul is killed on the battlefield, sadly with his son Jonathan with him, I might talk more about that, but I won't be, I better not be sidetracked. Maybe in discussion we will. You remember that the Amalekite comes on the scene, comes before David and talks of his enemies being defeated. And he presents the crown of Saul to David, thinking that he would gain some reward. Oh, he got that seriously wrong, didn't he? And he, Amalekite? Doesn't he know anything of the history of the Amalekites regarding what's written in, the, in the Exodus 17 and what was said of Samuel to Saul? And what happened to Agag? You know, Saul wouldn't slay him, but Samuel certainly did. Did he not know? But anyway, this fool comes before David thinking he would get a reward. And of course, he doesn't get a reward. He, uh, he loses his life. But look at look how, what he says. Um, he says, you know... Um, Oh, I've got a little bit ahead of myself. Sorry, there's this verse, and I'll get to that. Sorry. Uh, when Saul heard that David was discovered, and the men that were with him, now Saul abode in Gibeah under a tree in Ramah, having his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. Sorry, I'll just deal with this quickly. There's this, this little verse tucked away in the historical record, and it just says, you know, messengers come again and say, oh, look, we found where David is. And when they go and find Saul, he's in Gibeah, he's under a tree. But notice, he's got a spear in his hand. So there it is, spear in his hand. Now, let me get back to the Malachite. Because the young man says to David, and this is all rubbish, by the way. This is all fabricated nonsense. The young man said to him, I happen by chance to be upon Mount Gilboa. Behold, Saul leaned upon his spear. And lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. Well, you know, I don't know whether this story is just uh, in its uh, design. You know, God has overwritten it really because um, it, it's interesting little detail he puts there that Saul leaned upon his spear. Um, now, what he's suggesting is that, you know, he's wounded, he's grievously wounded. You know, he can barely breathe and he's holding himself up with his spear to get breath. That's the picture I think he's trying to paint. But isn't it interesting that he talks in terms of Saul leaning upon his spear? As I say, I think that the whole account is rubbish, but nevertheless, this is his story. And that word lean, there it is, occurs 22 times in Scripture. And it's in this proverb. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So let's just pause there for a minute. The wise man Solomon by the Spirit says, Trust in Yahweh with all thine heart. Trust in him. 
Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Now he learnt that from David, his father. He learnt that from David. And he says those words under the influence of the, the spirit from on high. And he speaks this truth. But I tell you this, brothers and sisters, he doesn't speak of Saul, does he? Because Saul always leans upon his own understanding, his own understanding. And that inevitably means that spear has got to be close to him and he's got to use that spear for his protection and for furthering his will. Um, sorry, I... I uh, Got a bit mixed up there with those verses. I do apologise, but I do hope it's come over to you, nevertheless, that we see Saul so often with his spear. Uh, and even when a messenger comes and tells him where David is, there he is under the tree, Gilboa under the tree, with a spear in his hand. And almost, I, I feel like the spirit is almost having a bit of an ironical a twist on it here, a bit of a sense of humour almost, that this Amalekite should have said, behold, I saw Saul leaning on his spear. Yeah, and it was the death of him, brothers and sisters. It was the death of him. He didn't trust in the Lord. That's his big mistake in life. But before um, we look at this next verse, these verses here from this psalm, I just... Just briefly, because time's rushing on. I'll just, just make this point. Is there a spear in our life? You know, do we have a spear that we turn to rather than the Lord? Now, that may be our own intelligence, our own ability to think of our way out of a problem or a situation that's difficult, our own intelligence, our own wit. Is that our spear? Uh, our own cunning, dare I say, put an evil spin on this now. Uh, our own guile, I hope not. You know, David, unfortunately, with the matter of Uriah, he, he, he went that way, didn't he? It was not typical of the man, but he went that way. Um and all the tragedy that unfolded from that, he, he, he became a man of guile. Do, do, do we go that way? Is it our intelligence? Is it our own wisdom? Do we lean on our own ability? Is that our spear, brothers and sisters? Or is it the fact that we're, you know, we're quite well, well off? I, you know, I think most of us can't say it of all because certainly we've got Iranian brothers and sisters uh, in our ecclesia uh, they've got very, very little, and we've got some elderly that are struggling too. So I know it's not true of all brothers and sisters, but there's so many of us, and I include myself in that group within Christadelphia, uh, that are reasonably well off. So perhaps when it comes to the fuel crisis and it's on the news, it's, it doesn't worry me so much as perhaps it would do others. Uh, who, who knows? I might get more anxious come end of the year. Maybe you'll get more anxious come end of the year, but either way, you know, is it our wealth? Is it that which we have materially, the comfort of our home, the security of our insurance policies? What is it? Are those things, in effect, uh, too highly prized and too, uh, too highly thought of? In effect, do they become a spear? Just, just an excitation on that, and only you can answer it. And, you know, I'm raising that. To myself and time and time I, I think of this you know where is my trust where's my confidence you know you can be wealthy of course you can you can be bright and intelligent I can think of half a dozen bright and intelligent brothers and sisters no problem within the book think no further than the likes of a Daniel or a Solomon uh, or a Joseph you know just straight off we, we, nothing wrong with intelligence but if we trust in it, then we do so to our folly. Nothing wrong with riches. 
Daniel Lightwise, Joseph. There are plenty of them that are rich. Um, Joseph of Arimathea. I, I, you know, we can go on. No, no problem. As long as we don't trust in riches, which Paul says by the Spirit in, the, in his letter to Timothy, are uncertain. Don't trust in certain riches. Don't do that. Trust those of you that are rich that are in Ephesus. Trust in God. Rather, if you are rich, be ready to distribute, to communicate, to give, to have a wide hand to those that I need. There's, there's the excitation. You know, what is the spear? Well, David, in this Psalm 35, in this Psalm, we know was given. During these times of troubles, when David is being hounded by Saul, which was over a period of years, brothers and sisters, not weeks, not months, years, long, long time. Um, so I'm not quite sure what particular point in that experience David gave this psalm. But I think it was round about the time of the, the, the difficulty in Gedi and, and the difficulty that we have here in 1 Samuel 26. It's, I think it's more likely to be around that region. And Lord, he says, plead, plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. Draw out also the spear. Stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. And in this prayer, David, in this prayer of Psalm 35, which is against this background of oppression and the hounding of Saul, he asks God to be his warrior. He asks God to stand up and fight for him. God to take the shield, the buckler, and to draw out the spear. He, he would stand back, confident that God would intervene and watch over. And God did, time and time again, God did. So David as God as his spear. Right, verse 8. Then Abishai, I said to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand. This day now, therefore, let me smite him, I pray thee with a spear, even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. Look, he's, he's, he's delivered, God has delivered you. At least he's using the terms of God now. He's trying to put a godly spin on this, isn't he? It's not just his thinking. You know, God surely has brought this about. It's your my opportunity for you. God has done this. I'll do it. I'll do it with his spear. I'll just thrust him through the once. I won't need to do it twice. I'll do it now. In the Nabishai, even in this, is learnt, you see, because before it was a question whether David would kill him in the cave. Well, they know David won't do it. But here it's a question, well, maybe I'll do it instead. And uh, ironically, you'd use the spear belonging to Saul. And David said to Abishai, destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anoint? anointed and be guiltless and David said furthermore as the Lord liveth the Lord shall smite him or his day shall come to die or he shall descend into battle and perish the Lord forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed but I pray thee take thou now the spear that is it at his bolster the cruise of water and let us go and that's what they did so um you know, Abishai thinks he's learned something from the previous occasion, um, but he hasn't really. You know, David's not going to let him do it. And David says, look, the Lord may slay him. He might die a death, as we would call it, natural causes, brothers and sisters. Or he may be killed in battle. But you're not going to do it. I'm not, not going to do it. We're not going to touch the Lord's anointed. And of course, out of those three things that David puts forward, we know in the end he's killed in battle. Um, 
It's just interesting how David views things. I'm not going to touch him, leave it all to the Lord, and the Lord would, will deal with it one way or another. It could be this way, that way, or even this third way. But God will do it. We will not. Recompense to no man, evil for evil, says the apostle. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If, if it be possible as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. And the apostle there quoting the words of Moses, or the words given to Moses in Deuteronomy 32. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. We, you know, don't, don't intervene. Don't recompense evil for evil. And even the Lord Jesus spoke of these things. And that level of this, brothers and sisters, the height of this bar is exceedingly high, isn't it? You've heard it's been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. You know, there's the standard, brothers and sisters, of the Lord Jesus, even higher than that of David. Because the Lord Jesus actually prays for a blessing. Not that God would necessarily come and judge them, such as we read in Psalm 35, but he takes it to a higher order. That he pray for his good, his well-being. And so we, if we have a difficult neighbor, if we have a difficult member in the family, dare I say it, or perhaps we ought not, maybe a difficult brother or sister somewhere along the line. But whoever, whenever, someone gives us a hard time, and it seems all so unjustified, someone in our life who's a bit of a shimmy eye, then this is the standard of the Lord Jesus, and it's difficult. At least I found it difficult. But that's what we should aspire to. Because when we behave like that, we're like unto God himself. It makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Right, I'm going to go through these very quickly now. Uh, verse 12. Um, I think we've, we've dealt with that really. They take those things. And... David has taken that which is so important to Saul, that spear and that water, the water of life. It's highly significant. He takes those two things, those two precious things. But God is more precious than, than both. And in verse 14, from a safe distance, David cries out, Answerest thou not, Abner? Who art thou that cries to the king? Art thou not a valiant man? Who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept thy lord the king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king thy lord. This thing is not good that thou hast done. As Yahweh liveth, you are worthy to die, because you have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. Now see where the king's spear is. And the cruise of water that was at his bolster. Wow, can you imagine the shock, the horror for Abner? More ways than one. Great shock and horror here. You know, it's the king's spear. If you ever wanted a token of the man's life, it's the king's spear. There's nothing, nothing that Saul holds more precious than that stupid javelin. There it is. And then Saul wakes up. Saul knew David's voice and said, is this thy voice, my son, David? It is my voice, my lord, my king. Wherefore doth my lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done? Or what evil is in mine hand? Now therefore I pray thee, let my lord, the king, hear the words of his servant. If the lord hath stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, cursed be they before the lord. For they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go, serve other gods. Now, therefore, let, 
not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as when one doth hunt a partridge in the mountains. There's a lot there, brothers and sisters, and I just can't do it just this, so I'm just going to move over, really. Um, Saul knew full well that was David's voice. But notice David in his humility says, look, you've got reason for coming after me. If there's a justified cause, I'll provide the offering to God. I'll make it good with God. Um, I think there was Psalm 7, but we can't go there now. Um, but you've been listening, Saul, to, to wicked counsellors, uh, and he had been. He'd been listening to the likes of people like Doeg. Then, in effect, they're driving me out, and they're driving me into the nations of false gods. Are they saying that I must serve them? No, in effect, that's what they've been wanting him to do, but that won't happen with David, of course, where, wherever he is. And uh, verse 20, I'm just going to highlight one or two things. It's interesting, isn't it? That David says, you, you come after me as if I'm a flea. You know, that's an amazing comment. You know, a flea, um, <laughs> it's not the most pleasant of creatures, is it? It's a horrible parasite. Uh, for someone to have fleas, they're in a pretty poor state. Awful. Horrible. But the flea, as you know, has this great ability to jump and go from one place to another, to another, to another. And that's what it was for David. He was going from one place to another. To He was just moving from one place to another. And sometimes he had to move real quick, just like a flea, from there to there to there. And he said, you're, just like, you're treating me like a flea, like I'm a parasite. You want to wipe me out like a flea, like I'm a parasite. I'm nothing more precious than a parasite, a flea. And you're causing me to jump here, there. You know, it's just a lot in that choice. Um, and then Saul, as sometimes did occur, you know, with him, it did here. He, he suddenly, his heart, which is so hard and full of bitterness, is softened. And he sees the righteousness of David. He sees it again. This is not the first time. We know what David said to him after the, 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 escape, the, the sparing of him in, in the cave of En Gedi. And then on other occasions, David had shown righteousness in the face of his unrighteousness. But here he sees it now. And he confesses, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for no more do thee, do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I've played the fool and have heard exceedingly. And so we have this repentance of Saul. Now, I dare say that David knew it was fickle that it was shallow, it was superficial, it would be transient and soon a matter of the past. But he forgave him. And it may be that situation with us, brothers and sisters, if one offends us once, twice, maybe comes to us seven times seeking our forgiveness, then we, like David, ought to give it even though we might suspect it's all very trite, these words we're hearing. And the master said, no, not seven times, but 70 times 70. And so we, in the spirit of David here, and wonderfully, supremely, of course, in the manner of the Lord Jesus, we, we forgive and we go forward. And so David says, Maybe an allusion back to Nabal, actually, when Saul talks about being a fool. We read of the fool in the previous chapter. You know, he was certainly being Nabal-like. David answered and said, Behold the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. Have, you, have your spear back for what it's worth. For what it's worth, there's your spear. And then he says these wonderful words, beautiful words, brothers and sisters. 
Yahweh render to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered me into my hand today, but I would not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in your eyes. Uh -uh. No, he doesn't say that. He can't say that because he knows that's not going to happen. So what's he say instead? Behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Wonderful that from David. Wonderful. Let's measure everything we do in the light of the eyes of the Lord, not with respect to men. And Saul gives this prophecy, and it's upheld. Blessed be thou, my son David, thou shalt do great things, and also shalt still prevail. And so David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place.